name is Toby Serafil. I am the newly elected president of Civic League. I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. I see a lot of new faces, and um, I know everyone hates this, but I'd like for everyone to go around the room and if you could just give us your name and where in the neighborhood you live or any other little information so that we can get to know each other. And my name is Toby Serafil. I live on Virginia Avenue. I've been to Colonial Place for five years.
assault, burglary, car larcenies, homicide, narcotics, rape, robbery, shooting, in, shooting meat into an occupied dwelling or into a car. Occupied car, that's what shooting is. Stolen vehicle and vandalism. As you can see, we're actually, the third patrol division is actually up um, of all the other patrol divisions. In the blue sector alone, we have a good amount of it. Also, the red sector, um, which I didn't put the red sector on here. Um, but I did put some of their, I also broke it down by civic leagues as well. So you can see the surrounding civic leagues as well as your civic leagues. You guys come in at 21 car larcenies, which obviously this weekend we had some more car larcenies. So, but if you look at the trends, and you can see now we have new people here. Usually, don't take this wrong, usually we don't have new people unless something's going on in the area. That's usually when people get to get involved and we see more people at civic leagues. But with you guys, you only had five in April, and then it went up to 13 in, in AO, May, and then now it's up to 21 plus the several from over the weekend. You can see in May for third patrol, we had 163 for the entire third patrol division. And then in April, I mean, and now we have 192. So it's going up in June. Basically what I try to do with this is to show you what's going on in the entire city, but it may so around you. It's happening everywhere and they seem to just be moving. As you can see on the trend, Ghent got hit. They had 28 in April, they had 51 in May, and this month they are at 31 for right now. As of Saturday, they were at 31. So Ghent is one of our areas that gets hit the most. Larchmont was right behind them. Now it seems they moved from Larchmont over to you guys. We have made some arrests. The problem we are having, and I put this out on next door, is people are not prosecuting. Larceny from auto is a huge problem, and it's hard for us to make arrests to begin with. Because we can literally be on one street, and unless we have a cop on every block of the street, you're not, you, it's a luck of a draw to finding somebody who's going around checking door handles or even breaking windows and grabbing stuff and going. We have video all of it, so we know that's the two things they're doing. Most of the time they're checking door handles, they're only breaking windows if they see something. Your guys' trend is starting to be more broken windows than door handles. Um, but it's tough for us to catch them. So when we catch them, it's actually good for, I mean, it's exciting for us. And then we take them to the victim, and the victim says, I just want my stuff back. We do everything we can to get them to prosecute. But if they do not prosecute, we have nothing. We don't have a victim anymore. The victim won't cooperate. There's nothing we can do. That is a huge problem we're having. We had somebody that had two MacBook Pros taken out of their vehicle, and all they wanted was them back. They would not prosecute. That's huge for us, and that would have been a felony, as you can tell. They would not prosecute. So now these people understand they can go in these neighborhoods, they can commit these crimes. Every once in a while they get caught, but as long as they get the things back, they can continue the next night. So please, 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 if we come to you, prosecute. Because the other problem we have with Darcy from Autos is when we do catch somebody and we have stuff on them, they have no clue what cars they broke into. So we search up and down blocks trying to find cars that may have been gone through, and then we try to locate the owners. And that's obviously a tough thing because you don't have a clue. If they didn't take anything or they didn't make something visible to see that that car was broken into, we don't know. With the broken windows, obviously it's a little bit easier, but it, for most time when they have the unlocked vehicles. So my main thing with that, guys, is please, one, report it. Because I see there's some reports. I'm being told there was like 17 over the weekend. We're only having 11 reports come in. That's a problem as well. Just because it's put out on, so, on, on next door or somewhere else, doesn't mean it's reported. You have to make an official report with us because what is also happening is we have an overtime detail for Larson from autos in the third precinct. What we pay attention to is where the trends are, where they're hitting the most. Obviously, this is the area they're hitting most, so they will move that into this area. They don't want to be bottled with court. You gotta come to court. You have to come, and it's a, it can be a long process. They won't even. I know some of them that have happened. They won't even go through the insurance company. 
Yeah, they just have it. They just blow it off. And we've had a lot of times when people won't even report it. They'll put it out on next door or they'll put it out here or there, but they won't actually make a report. And we have to have those reports in order to do stats. I saw your post on next door and it was excellent. The next time you write on there, can you write that? That posts are correlated with at you know overtime detail or whatever, so that people all also recognize that you yes. can get more more police if people report. Yes, definitely, I will, and that and that's what I was trying to put out, but I'll make sure I clarify completely. Yeah. Because that's that's exactly what we and I talk about a lot is if we know things are going on, we watch these trends. So before anybody even notified me, I already knew what was going on because we have to watch these. Once we watch them, I notify my lieutenant and let him know what's going on, and then he immediately we put the detail out. Now, the detail has bikes, it has attack it has us, um, and we're doing it overnight hours. So it, it's eight hours overnight, so it's, it's going to a good part. The other problem with the varsity for motto, and somebody was talking about, I know somebody on there was talking about cameras and how they can be, they're not good or whatever. Cameras do help us. They help us with two things. One, if we can identify the people, I'm telling you guys, the people that are doing these are not new to the system. They're people we know. We see people in the area, we immediately stop them because we know what they have a record of. We know who they are. If they don't have anything on them, we can't find anything, all we can do is document it. But we continue to do that, eventually they're going to move, that's exactly what happened. They moved to a new area because that happened. But we couldn't prosecute them because we didn't have anything on them. But the cameras help us identify that they're in the area. They also help us with the time. So if you have a camera, please make sure that time is set. And the reason being, larceny from autos, your larceny from autos are usually going to happen between 8 o'clock at night and 5 o'clock in the morning. That's a humongous gap for us to say, okay, they're hitting this area at this time. We go around, and we're on the next block, they're hitting this block. But if we know what time they hit, because you have a camera and you saw them in the area, it just helps us narrow it down. Okay, maybe we need to concentrate between one and three, or maybe we need to do that. So it does help. So if you get, if something happens to you or your neighbor and you have cameras, please, please, please check those. See if you have any kind of footage and let us know immediately on the camera. On the camera. Um, I'm trying to think of everything else. Does anybody have any questions so far? Um, I know a couple, there's some, some comments out there um, and about more police and, and all that stuff. Um, on this, I actually put out the calls for service that we have to handle. That's this number down here. These are the calls for service from April 1st to April, the end of April. Now it's just third precinct calls for service. So just your area calls for service, 5,537 calls for service. We are very busy. We have been busy since January 1st. Our murders are up, our violent crime is up, and our property crime. It's kind of like the people who are doing the property crime, they don't want the conflicts, but they have realized that we have violent crime up. So they're upping their game as well as the violent crime. So it's kind of a, an unsteady balance is what we've seen this year. All of our numbers have been up. Um, for July, June 1st to July 9th, 7,475 calls for service in the third precinct. So we had two more two thousand more calls for service between April, May, and June. Or between June and between the other two. So we are very busy. Kids are out of school, have nothing better to do. And when I say kids, I don't necessarily mean kids. Our ages that we're catching doing out here is between 15 and 25. That's your core group. I also saw somebody commented about they're coming from other cities. We have confirmed one group of people coming from Newport News that did hit here and they did hit Larchmont. But for the main part, it is people from the city. It's people from surrounding areas that can walk over here, do what they do, and walk back. They can also ride bikes over here. They, and if they find your car, if your car's unlocked and they find a key in it, they're going to steal your car and leave the bike. And they take your car to a ride. More than likely, the places to look for the cars, unfortunately, is Park Place, Lambert Point, around the new area or into Huntersville. That's most of the places where we're, we're, we're finding the cars. Also, um, Fairmont Park. We were finding a lot of cars in Fairmont Park. We did make an arrest on that, but we were finding. Um, and that's the other thing. 
if you have your, especially a newer car, and you have a key, a valet key, or you don't know if you have a valet key in your glove box, please check your manual and take the valet key out. Because what happens is usually when you buy a new car, they, hand, they put the valet key in that manual, you stick it in your glove box, totally forget it's even there. Well, these guys know. All they're gonna do is when they get it to your car, they're gonna, they're, a lot of people have said, it's been ransacked. The reason it's ransacked is they're checking for that valet key. That's how they get stolen vehicles. And all the stolen vehicles we had, that's mainly how it happened. Is they check for that valet key and they take it. Most of the time all they do is joy ride, so we find it within probably a week. But that's a week without you having a car and not knowing if it gets in an accident, if it was involved in robberies, because we had a group that were stealing cars and then going into robberies with the cars. Mm -hmm. So we've had all different issues. Um, like I said, it has been an active year. But we do know what's going on in the area, and the detail will be in the area as well. So between here and Ghent uh, is where we're getting hit in the blue sector. Does anybody have questions, concerns? Besides what I've already I just said. Have a, just a thought. Of all those comments, like the, you said, we have, you have that many calls they have to respond to. Are there things that we are calling you about that we shouldn't be calling you about so you can spend time on other things that are more important? Are there are those kind of areas something we should think about? Uh, that's tough to say. And the reason I say that is because I don't want something, everybody to think it's something small, like somebody walking down the street that you know doesn't belong, right. and they don't call about that, and that's the one person that breaks in. Um, so I don't want to say don't call us. That is our job. I'm just trying to prove that we are going, our guys on the street, are literally going from call to call to call for 12 hours. And then they get off, the next shift comes out and does the same thing. So, and, and I mean, accidents are even up, up, it seems like up lately as well. So it's kind of like everything, I don't know, what is going on in 2016, but apparently things are going up. Um, and I know people mentioned more police. We push academies out as fast as we can, but I will tell you we have an academy that graduates on Thursday, matter of fact. And they start, I don't know how much they start with, but usually it starts, we do about 50 to 70% actually graduate um, because of what we have to go through to come out, obviously, to deal with some of the things we deal with, which you can all see. Um, but on top of that, you have a lot of different things why people are off the street. We have had a lot of police shootings lately. That takes people off the street for a good, it depends on the investigation, but it could be up to a year that they could be off of the street. Then you have the accidents, the same thing. So then you have other reasons they leave or don't leave and, and things going on. So we lose a lot of people. I think they say we lose an average of nine people a month. So, so we can only push them up so fast. Not to mention the process of getting them in and getting qualified applicants and that type of thing. So, um, and I know the other thing somebody commented on as far as having more district cars as far as in your area. Um, large one. And so the same thing, and so is Ghent. They're not happy with the fact that they only have one district car for the area. Ghent has one because they have West and West Ghent, regular Ghent, and they have all kinds of problems. I mean all kinds of breakdowns over there. Um, but it depends on the area, is how they do it and how planning districts. Obviously way above my pay grade. But it is, you guys have one car between you, Larchmont, and Highland Park, which all have similar issues. Um, and then Ghent has one car, Park Place, um, and Villa Heights has one car, and Lambert's Point has a car, and that's all my cars for. That's basically how the blue sector breaks down. And then you go, and you go over the bridge and go into the red sector. So there's no car regularly patrolling our neighborhood? If they're not on a call for service. And it seems to me you said they go call to call to call. So it's probably most important that anything that looks suspicious that we make a call and don't expect that a, a random police car will come through the neighborhood. And exactly. And the thing I will say about that too, some people say I call but they won't send somebody. Just so you know, when you call dispatch, it is a civilian. It is not a police officer. They are civilians. They feel sometimes that if you call in, they may question you and they feel like they're helping us by questioning you and getting you to say you don't want a car, but in all reality, it hurts us. So if you see something suspicious or you feel like you need a car, tell them to send a car. If they continue to question them, guess what? Everybody has a supervisor. Okay, ask for the supervisor.
supervisor, get their name, make, because we have had an issue with this where I've told people to come to meeting after meeting and told people to call and then they say, I called like you told me to and they wouldn't send the car. Or we've had issues where they said, I called, I did the research because they said no car ever showed up, I did the research, there was never one put in. So depending on what you tell that dispatcher depends on if we're even sent. So sometimes we get yelled at and we would never even sit to the call. So there's that mis miscommunication. So if you feel like and if somebody doesn't show up, call back. Those types of things. Yes, ma'am. The related comment is that sometimes when I have a truck in the past, not recently, but sometimes in the past when I've tried to call and make a report, they've told me that they won't receive a report or they won't take a report. So what type of things? in New Jersey, I escalated and insisted that a report be made and get a report number. But I think that a lot of people, if you call to make a report and they say, oh, we're not, we don't need to make a report for that, would not take that extra step. So I'm wondering, as part of a Civic League, if there's anything that we can do to work together with you, because I love this dialogue that we have, and I'm wondering if there's anything that we can do to work together to make sure that those calls are that, that that communication circle is working better. So well, when we call them to get a report, right. we make sure that our people are getting a report number, that that means then that you guys know about it. Right. And that's the thing I've had, and I mean, I know we have a lot of new faces, and that's that's a good thing, that we have a lot of new faces. Hopefully you continue to come even after this spike goes down, and you can share things as well and bring people, other people in, because that is important, because Regardless if it's me or someone else, there's always going to be a police officer here. Now I say always. There might be an issue for some reason if they can't, but there'll be communication. Um, but I would say 99% of the time, I will. I've been here. I've been a CRO for 11 years. I've been on the department for 16. So I've been doing this one job for 11 years, coming to civic leagues and all that. Um, but when I put out, I give my information out, which is also in the newsletter. My information out. So if something happens. And for some reason you call now depending on what you're calling for a report. Now car larcenies, 100 percent we need it reported. So any kind of larcenies, uh, burglaries, things like that. Um, it's it depends on what the other things are. There's some things we can't do a report for, but like lost property and things like that. But for any kind of larcenies, a report should be filed. Now if something happens and they say for some reason, I've even somebody told me, well, it was under five hundred dollars, so they said they wouldn't take it. That's bull crap. That's, that's not true. Even an attempt, even if your car was unlocked and they entered that car and attempt to steal something, that still take, that's still a report that needs to be filed as an attempt larceny. I have things on my list that are attempt larcenies, but we know they still were at that location. They still tried to enter a car and steal something. So we still need to know those. But if something happens and they talk you out of it or they tell you they can't take it or whatever, that's what my number's for. That's what your CRO is for, because I will take the, I can take it over the phone, as long as I'm in front of the computer, I can get all your information and take it over the phone, I can come to your, I've been known to go to, I've gone to numerous houses, got information, came back, called them, gave them a report number, we have tablets in our car usually, um, so I can usually do it right there, or I can do it at the office, it doesn't matter. So that's, that's one way I try to help in that aspect, the more way is just educating people that there's always a boss that if they refuse to send somebody, tell them to send somebody. I was just wondering if there's anything that we can do because you're talking to right. people who are clearly already interested about this. We're maybe more likely to escalate, but is there anything that we can do to support getting those people to take those reports? The only thing I would say is word of mouth. I put it out on next door all the time make a report, make a report. When I'm off duty, I'm bad for this, but when I'm off duty, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the stuff going about to go on in large amount with all the walk, the marches and stuff. Um, literally this weekend, I was on my phone the entire weekend when I was off. Obviously Saturday I was off and I was still doing this. Um, so the communication, when I see something going on and I see like I did, I commented on your guys' larceny stuff, the same thing I put out there, and I don't know if I did on that, I've had so many things come in, so. But I usually put out there, make sure you make a report. Call the police and make a report. That's the only thing, the only way I know to do it. We, we do have flyers, but flyers, I will tell you next door, we'll catch more people than flyers will. Um, so that's the way we used to do it, to go around with flyers. Is there a difference between calling 911 uh, for 456 and actually calling to make a report? 
you're calling it an incident, or it's actually making it a report. You have to call it a report. Correct? Right? Not necessarily. Okay, that's a good question. So, 911, obviously, for emergencies. The thing is, 911, 441, 5610 are not emergency numbers. They both are the same people that sit right beside each other. The only difference is, 911, they can see your numbers. So when you call 911, we have call ID for obvious reasons, because if you have an emergency and you call and you have to hang up, we know where you are, we have your number, that type of stuff. Non-emergency does not capture any of that information. So when you call non emergency and they ask you for your address, your name, your phone, or your, they'll have your phone number, but your name or whatever, it's because they don't have, that is not documented as far as, or they don't have caller ID, is what I'm trying to say with that. The, uh, as far as making a report, if it's over $500, they're going to send an officer out for a report. They, they've been sending officers out for even under that, um, just because the, the call comes and they send somebody to take a report. But sometimes they will tell you when you call, but it's when you call in, they'll tell you to call word process, which they take the report over the phone. So, it, but they'll give you the phone number for that as well. And I'm sorry, I don't have that phone number on my head right now. But one of those three ways, it just be, the only difference is an officer would actually come to the location and do it right there, or they would do it over the phone. It depends on the way you prefer. But if it's over $500, we have to have an officer come there just to verify. It, that, that's exactly what happened. Just, so you just oh. quick, do you have, um, like, should you go online or email? Oh, yeah. And, like, you know do what? it that way? They, like, did just you, start, like, they did just start doing that online at norfolk.gov where you can file a report. Thank you for mentioning that. I haven't used that yet, so I couldn't tell you anything about it, but they have done it online where you can actually file a report online because I've gotten several reports that say, and they tell us, file it online. So the only thing with filing it online is we don't get exact, like you put in the information. So if you don't put in what we need, we don't have it. So the difference is if we have you on the phone or we have you in person, we can ask you the exact question. That's the only difference. But yes, they do. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Aside from the obvious, don't leave your cars online, leave our porch lights on, that kind of thing. As a neighborhood, as a group, what can we do that encourages people to move along with some other neighborhood or some other citizens? Okay, uh, what I recommend, obviously, lock doors. Um, don't keep anything in plain view. And by anything, I mean book bags, uh, any kind of bag, because they broke out windows and stole gym clothes. They just broke the windows, please God. It's some, and we're having that issue here lately. All they're doing is vandalizing the cars. They're not actually even going into the cars, they're just vandalizing. That, only thing, I, only thing I can say for any of this, to be honest with you, is if you see something that, that doesn't seem right, but you say, eh, I'm not gonna worry about it. by the time the cops get there, they're gonna be gone. Don't do that. But they went into the car to take stuff out of Right. The window. I know, and that's unusual. That's a different group, because our other groups don't do that. Yeah. The groups we've been dealing with have that. This is the first trend of breaking the windows, I will tell you. But what I'm saying is, if you see something suspicious or you see someone suspicious, call no matter what. And the reason I say that is the only way we move them along is obviously with an arrest. But even just the fact that the neighborhood is watching, you call, even if they're down the block or they're hiding in a bush, they see that police car, they understand someone else is paying attention. That's the important part of it. No matter where they are, obviously our cars are billboards. They see us. They are able to. They see that somebody is watching. Some reason we were called into that area. So that's the main thing: is call no matter what, no matter if you think we're going to get there or not. I still want you to call, and you can just say you don't want them to see you, but still get them in the area is my main thing. That's the only way we've been successful successful and that helps with the arrest but if you see something you have to call and get on next door and report what you've seen and join yes. next door it yes. is fabulous i was going to say next door is a huge thing um i'm one of the only officers that's actually on next door the way i am because i actually violate next door policy by being on there the way i am next door thinks that the neighborhood should be allowed to say whatever you want to say and since i don't live in the neighborhood i shouldn't intervene um, that's why I'm on as Larchmont. And the reason I'm on as Larchmont is because Larchmont had the biggest population of Nextdoor before it got huge. Now they have over 1,500 people on Larchmont alone. 
Um, but when they first started, they had 300. Everybody else had 10 maybe and did, or didn't even know about it until it came out to the public and stuff. So what if you post something, you have to put Larchmont as, as a neighborhood in for me to see it. I check crime. I get notifications for crime and safety constantly. Trust me. My watch and my phone went off all weekend. And you do that um, for your settings, so in case anyone doesn't know that. You can set your settings to do it that way. Yes. Or when you make a post, you can set it to Larchmont. And once that post is made, I can see it. Like the cloning place, somebody put Larchmont, so I was able to see what was going on. And the same thing with Larchmont does for you guys. And I've been telling everybody that thing. It's good to show other neighborhoods everything going on. But aren't we getting notices from next door that says our resource officers are in our neighborhood on next door? I don't see those. Well, now we're getting them from directly from. I was going to say, the what happens is, is you, okay, there is a Norfolk Police next door page. Now, when you post a website, I mean, if you post a post on next door, it asks you, do you want to notify the police? It does ask you that. Problem with that, and I fought next door tooth and nail to this. The problem with that is, all that does is go downtown. So then you're going to wait for it to go downtown. They're going to, and I will tell you, many of the captains and the chief have come to me and said, Carrie, what's this post on next door? Because they know I can see it. So that's what happens. And then we, on the Norfolk Police, police page, you will see our PI, our public information officer, and our crime prevention sometimes. They will post on next door. That's probably what you're talking about. They will post on next door to all the areas in Norfolk. Different stuff going on. So we can't actually send out a post, even if I tried to send, if I was on the Norfolk Police page and I tried to send out a post to just you guys, it would go to everyone in the entire city. And I cannot see anything back from you guys. That's the problem. We, if I'm on the Norfolk Police page, I cannot see anything in crime and safety. And the reason that is, is because Nextdoor says you should be able to say what you want and I don't intervene. I will tell you, there are surrounding neighborhoods that my partners, as CROs have tried to get on, and they said, absolutely not. We talk bad about you. We don't want you on. We talk bad about the police. They talk bad about the police on mine. I don't get involved in it. I'm like, but that's why they won't allow us. So you have the Norfolk Police page, but we can't see anything you said. But they, I mean, there are officers, don't get me wrong. You talk bad about them, they're going to take it to heart, and they're going to say things we shouldn't say. So I understand part of it, but I try to tell them, just give us the crime and safety. I don't care about anything else. If you give us the crime and safety, then we can hear what's going on and see what's going on. But they won't. So that's the next door. But it is a good app for community. But the only thing I do want to point out, she's exactly right, but call us first, then go post on next door. Because we do have a problem with that. You laugh, but we have a problem with that. I have been called last, or I should say, I, the police have been called last, and the guy's already six houses down, but the direct store was notified as soon as they left that house. So make sure you call the police first, because no one on next door is going to go out and hopefully hunt these people down. That's the other thing I did have to touch your base on. There were some things on the post that came into that, that type of stuff. I will tell you, are you guys part of um, our neighborhood watch program? I think you are, right? No, I don't think so. No? Okay. If you're not, you need to be. So that's something, since you have this audience, maybe you can start looking so that's a way to also educate. We have um, Neighborhood Watch. They would put signs up in your area and actually you can even contact the crime prevention and they would not talk about it. But basically they put signs up in your area. You are now put on a certain list. You have um, one captain and then they have uh, block captains all over the neighborhood. So you do have to get people to sign up to help. But it doesn't take that many to start with. But once you're on our um, community, I mean our um, neighborhood watch, the one thing I was going to say, because I saw things on the post talking about following people or going out and doing their own patrolling, that type of stuff, we will kick you off. Reason being, obviously everyone knows the incident down in Florida. We can't have that happen. Our job is, regardless of what happens out on the street, we are to respond. We are to handle it. We're trained and hopefully we go home after the incident. But that's our, that's why we get paid the not so big bucks. But that was the issue we had and the reason we don't have block captains now is the block captains really don't have any power. We, we didn't have a lot of volunteers when our crime was low. And that's why I'm saying. But, but what, what does a block captain do? I mean, if the, if the conduit of communication. 
communication is next I was door. Gonna, I was going to say, basically what the block captains do, and I don't know all of it because I don't deal with the neighborhood watch right. stuff, but basically what happens is that if something happens and you know your block captain, you would notify them, they would send it up to the, and then it would just circle around. Also, when we have information, we disseminate it down. It's a great program. It goes hand in hand with next door. Um, some of the things you'll see on next door actually come from our neighborhood watch program. Um, they'll put out different stuff going on in the area, tips, things like that. Um, so they work hand in hand with us. I just don't know all the particulars with the neighborhood watch program. But the crime prevention will definitely come do a talk for that. They also do home uh, surveys. How do we set it up with crime prevention now that we're? Uh, Dave, we'll contact them and find out. Oh, she so doesn't have all all the details. I'll just say six six one six six four sixty nine zero one is crime prevention. Six six four sixty nine zero one. The Mount Holly Community Affairs. Same same. Six six four sixty nine zero one. Um, so the other thing they do, but I'll talk. Is to Daniel you. Hudson from the police department he's is posted on here. He's, he's not our police officer. No, I. He's the police information officer. He's downtown in the Ivory Tower. He's the police. He's a. Um, he's our media guy. He goes and talks. So he puts it out to everyone in the entire city. That's what he does. He puts it out to everyone in the entire city. Um, the other thing crime prevention also does is they do home surveys. In case you don't know if it's something you're interested in. Thank goodness burglaries are not up, but it, it's not a bad thing to look into if that's what you want. It's a free service we provide. They come out to your house. They look around and give you um, tip, um, prevention tips on what you can, you can do to try to help yourself. Where you like if you're looking at doing cameras, they can even help you where to maybe position them. If your your hedges are too tall, are too um, tall, your lighting's not right. I mean, they go into all these different things. It's a free service; they can they can come out and do it. So you can also contact them for that as well. I hope they still do it. Why can't the city? Why can't the city put uh, camera monitoring in? They looked at that before down at Ocean View and somewhere else. It was only gunshot cameras. Um, and, but besides that, I don't know. I mean, like there's three entrances to this neighborhood. It seems to me if you had a couple of neighbors at each, each entrance and they could video cars coming in, people coming in, at least you have a video of each person. Yeah, that's way above my favorite. <laughs> I can't, I, I can't help you too. There's three entrances. I was going to say, you got to consider the, the, all this city, I had, what did I, I looked at that. It's a ridiculous amount of civic leagues we have in the city of North Carolina. Um, and, and I know what you're saying. It is easy for your, but then there's other neighborhoods. Right. So it's, it can get very expensive. Ocean View did petition for them, and I don't even think they're active anymore. And that was only gunshot cameras. They yep. weren't even. They we have cameras. Cameras at each block, and they all put cameras on their house, and they pay for them themselves. That would be a big, huge thing. And then mm -hmm. put signs up saying, the you know, survey, video surveillance and anybody that's video surveillance be a big turn. No, I, I mean, I agree with you. It's I just mean, that could be the homeowners. The, way, the way you have to remember the way our city manager looks at it and the way the mayor and everything else, if we do that for one neighborhood, we have to do it. For, I'm going to tell you right now, when I did, I did a tri community event with you guys, Highland Park, and Largemont. Used my own money, did an event with the dunk tank. That it, we had kickball with the kids, we had cornhole, we had, I had all the departments out there. Um, what else did we have? We had food. Um, yeah, we had a whole bunch of stuff. So I, I did this whole event with you guys. When I asked my captain for money, I was told, well, I wanted money for the dump tank initially. Um, and I was told that would not be enough. They would help me with the food, but if I had the dump tank in one location, they would have to have that at all the other events that are in the city. That's the way we have to look at it. Because I guarantee, I know for a fact, because we had an event at Park Place and we had an event in High, um, Villa Heights. Villa Heights said I want exactly what Park Place got. The other one said I want exactly. So then if they would have found out I had one of my communities, although it was me and the Civic Leagues that took care of it, they still, because we're part of it, we have to not do anything different in any community. And although I was the only one that got in the dunk tank in like 50 degree weather, it was cold. But it was it was a, an event to bring everybody out. We've been looking at um, down the line probably for another one. It's just I'm not gonna lie, that was a lot. It, it was rough. 
but, but that's what I'm saying about the camera. They look at it the same way. If they do it for one, we have to do it for all. Anybody else? Eric, thank you, Eric. No problem. We appreciate it. No problem. And my stuff is all in the uh, newsletter. If you have an old one, it's MacLeod, that's still me. Ford, MacLeod, it doesn't matter. I mean, the robots in the middle of the back. But uh, my information is there. I will tell you guys, next door, which I just told you I'm on there, as well as my email are the two best ways to get a hold of me. That phone number is a city cell phone. It's like this one, the slider ones. I don't know if you guys know, but it doesn't do much. If you send me a text on that, I don't usually get it. So email me or next door, because that comes to my personal phone, and I always check it. Okay? Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sign in, we uh, take attendance, it goes towards our earn funds for the uh, environment. So, more people will come through me and more points we get. Okay, um, so let's see. Uh, remind y'all to turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. And have refreshments up here in front. We've got coffee, we've got water back there, we've got cookies and sweet things. So, please help yourself. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce, we've been waiting here so patiently. Christine Pastenbaum, who is the volunteer programs coordinator for our zoo next door, and Greg Bachman, the director of the zoo, and they're going to tell us a little bit about what's going on now. Uh, well, thanks for inviting us here today. How many people have been to the zoo in the past five years? How many people have been the past year? All right, that's awesome. Great to know. Uh, I've lived on the property in the neighborhood there for 10 years, uh, and I've worked at seven zoos around the country, around the world a bit. Uh, my specialty is birds, just to give you a little bit of a background about myself. And I started in the zoo business when I was 16, giving pony rides in my neighborhood zoo in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I have kind of a long history of uh, working in the zoo business, and I really came here because uh, I think the zoo is a great piece of property. When I was here, it was mostly the Africa, the reptile house, and Asia wasn't there yet. We've had a lot of uh, kind of visitor amenities from the train rides to enhancing our restaurants and all those sorts of things. So what I do feel is a, a really a terrific place, and I would place it probably as a, a solid medium-sized zoo uh, in the U.S. Of, of the accredited zoos in this country. And we are accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, uh, there's about 232 other zoos that are accredited. And just to give you an idea of what that means, there's about 2,500 places that are licensed by USDA to show people animals. Uh, to be accredited, you have to maintain a very high standard when it comes to how you care for your animals, uh, what sort of educational programs you deliver to your visitors, uh, and the whole gamut of everything you really see in the zoo. And then we're expected every five years to make sure we're maintaining those that high standard are for our industry. Uh, but I have a little bit of, I'll show you what, what's going on new with the zoo. If someone wants to get the lights, we can see a little bit better. Uh, I'll put it my new one there.
country. This is some of our earlier drawings, like I told you, we have floor to ceiling windows, and this is it today where you can really observe what's going on in that hospital. So you can do into our treatment room, our surgery room, our doctor scrub room, our laboratory, and then turn the corner and you can look into our uh, animal dietitian. But when the economy, uh, we designed the hospital and the economy had just been in the year of 2008, this was a $4 million project. Our bids for the project came in about an average of $3 million. If you look at Asia Trail of the Tiger, you might remember that opened in 2011. That was, we went to bid on that project when the economy had not yet tanked. So we think we could have saved probably two and a half million dollars if we had waited another 12 months to go to bid on that project. But it's very likely that we wouldn't have gone to bid on that project like that to expand because I mean, all the entire economy was so shaky uh, that we thought we would have. And most of your economists said that if you're able to move forward on a business project like that, you'll probably be far better off at the end of a bad economy. So now that we're kind of leaving, or getting our economy is getting stronger, we are far better off, if you can imagine, our Asia project hadn't been built. So I think it's just an interesting business plan uh, how we went about that. And to give you an idea of the funding of the zoo, uh, we are about 70% city uh, operational tax support. Uh, supports our operations at the zoo, and then about 30% is funded by our nonprofit arm, and that's the Zoological Society. So through the Zoological Society, we run the marketing department, the education department, all of our membership, uh, all of our PR and communications. Um, so a significant chunk of what we do at the zoo is funded by that nonprofit arm. And then they also do the fundraising for all the new projects on zoo grounds which then they in turn donate to the zoo after the project is constructed, is constructed, whether it be the renovation of the restaurant, the putting our zoo train in, or a big project like Asia, just to let you know where, uh, how we manage the zoo. A lot of neat things at our animal wellness campus is there's a Norfolk Gardeners Club that yeah, donated the funds to build this pond in the zoo, uh, or at the end of the wellness campus, which is a really nice component of that area. The you know, entire campus is supposed to speak to outdoor activity, good medical checkups, good nutrition, it's good for animals and good for you. So that's the kind of messaging to reach, especially children that visit that site. And then we also partnered with the uh, cardiologists at Centera Hospital to do our cardio uh, checkups on our apes just in the past year. So we have some really amazing partnerships to help us get the jobs done. And if you've seen our zoo farm, I think it's a pretty remarkable area. Uh, I think a lot of these barns were built in the mid-60s, you might remember they were all red. Um, and we had primarily a kind of gravel path that led through that area just a year ago. And today it's a, a far different place, uh, much cleaner. We put in a brick path, we put in that um, cedar wall all the way around that central island, and then we painted all of our buildings different colors. So if you remember the zoo of the past, that blue barn right there was actually a smokehouse when it was first built. It was Designed to show you how we smoke ham in this part of the country. Um, and then there's a root cellar and other elements in that area that we changed up with it and added new animals to the collection. So it's come out remarkably well. Um, to give you an idea where the goats go and uh, go to and where they come from, we actually loan some of our animals into the zoo. Like the goats come from a hobby farmer that's just about three hours from here. And the, the goat business has changed. Like I said, I started with the children's zoo where you got the, the Nubia and the goats uh, to bring into your collection to let our visitors have. Well, these are actually the pedigree dwarf Nigerian goats. So that's how far kind of our hobby farmers have come today. Um, as you know, like just like the organic market or the farm to table scene, and now there's the hobby farm. So we actually just uh, acquired some baby doll sheep too. Uh, from the hobby farm right here in the state of Virginia, but it's really, it's exciting to me because these are really show goats. When you think about show dogs, are very, very well taken care of and managed and uh, uh, just a really nice animal to have at the zoo. And then they go back to the farm in the fall and she makes cheese and so out of their milk. So that's where the goats go to if you're wondering where they go to the season. We've also got some very uh, unique Pigs. These are kumi kumi pigs. They are more a heritage breed of the animal that was bred to live on small farms in Europe, so they did require a lot of uh, a lot of land to live on. But they 
they live a better life than, say, agricultural hogs that go to slaughter that are only really meant to live in eight to nine months, I think it is. These guys will live to 16 years. So a different kind of pig that's smarter, uh, but you can see them walking around in their leashes from the zoo, too. And a neat um, element that we added to the zoo farms we have largely are Virginia farm type animals, but as you immediately walk into that zoo farm, we wanted to kind of create an area of unusual animals, which, which are really the rodents of the world. Porcupines are rodents. When you come up to that first blue building in our zoo farm, we have two species of porcupine. One on the left uh, is an African crested porcupine, very large, we get about this big, ours are about half grown. And then the tree overhead, we have the South American <coughs> tail porcupines. So we're kind of enhancing this kind of what I would call maybe uniquely bizarre uh, rogue collection on one side of the zoo farm just to change it up a little bit. We've also got a Vintron exhibit there, an unusual uh, species of um, African guinea fowl, which is like their wild chicken there. Give you an idea of how big they are. But very And then as part of that rodent collection, we've got the second largest rodent in the world, and that's the South American KB. It kind of looks like something between a, a rabbit, a donkey, and a guinea uh, pig. But that's about how big they are right there. They're actually an animal that uh, someone has shown in a guinea pig uh, show. Uh, so they're just kind of an interesting animal. And then this, these are baby doll sheep, or smaller sheep breed. They'll be, they should be on the zoo farm the next uh, and then we also have zebu cattle that are in our quarantine facility right now, and they're a miniature cow, uh, so they'll be out there too. So we're trying to really create an area uh, in the zoo that's very immersive. Kids can go and ride with the animals. They're not overly intimidating, but they're a lot of fun to me. Uh, just some recent babies you might have seen in the past year. This is yellowback diaper. They share the exhibit with their giraffe. Uh, they can kind of haunt the more woodsy areas along the giraffe exhibit, but um, you'll see this little baby out there with his mother. Uh, we've had numerous bongo born at the zoo, um, I think about a dozen in the past 10 years. Um, and we were one of six zoos that actually sent bongo back to Kenya to, to be put back in part of their range where they'd become extinct. So we did that with a handful of other zoos. And if you're wondering why we hold animals like that, that's why you wait. No stop, you can just keep that is there to stay on a scale. So that's a common way for us to get weight on young animal like that. And they're usually only calm like that for the first 48 hours when you can pick them up. Um, here, uh, the only zoo in the U.S. that's right at Casuari in the past decade. This is a remarkable bird. We have two exhibits of them, an adult pair that's kind of behind our kangaroo exhibit. And then we've put one of their offspring um, and another exhibit in our Asia area. Uh, and then we just had a baby zebra at the zoo. Uh, 
Hebrews. Um, this is one that um, inhabits more rocky areas in Africa. It's a very small population. What's unique about them is that because they do climb in the high, the rocky areas, their bones grow much faster than our other super species. Uh, but we do have a nice uh, group of male and two females and an elephant to offspring. All of our animals, too, are uh, there's a committee of experts that really sits to manage each animal species you see at the zoo, especially the mammals. And that would include a veterinarian, keepers, and curators that have worked with them for a very long time, probably the nutritionists, <coughs> from the education department. And that committee really writes the rules and guidelines and standards for caring for that species of animal, whether it be the zebra, red pandas, or lions. And they tell us when to breed those animals. We don't breed anything really willy nilly, everything's uh, managed either reproductively or whether they're kept separate. Uh, because you can imagine if you had too many lion cubs, you'd have that family overrepresented in the gene pool. They're dangerous and expensive to feed, very expensive to house. Uh, so, and I don't like to say that animals are bred to order, but to maintain the long term survivability of the species, you have to have the strongest gene pool possible. So, when we breed an animal, they tell us when to breed them, and then they tell us where to send those animals to meet their perfect genetic match for future breeding. So uh, it's an interesting concept, but it's really the science behind the zoo business. But just about all the animals you see in accredited collections are managed in this manner. So all our uh, young animals will most often be sent to other zoos to meet their perfect uh, partners. We have some screamer chicks. These are at our zoo farm. This is a really unusual bird from South America. They kind of look like the Dr. Seuss hawk turkey. Um, chicken, but they're actually a, uh, a unique duck species from South America. We're going to have to take a close look at them. They're chicks uh, almost as big as the adults, how they grow pretty fast. And then we uh, have some really neat chameleon species called the Mellers chameleon. This is one of the largest chameleon species in the world. We actually acquire these animals when someone was trying to sell them from the LA airport, and the US Fish and Wildlife caught the person. And, uh, you can imagine they need to find a home for these animals immediately if they're going to survive because they need, uh, they're pretty delicate, they need specific attention. So we acquired these six animals. They actually came in the, with like a sock sleeve that the smuggler was bringing them through and they were shipped to us. They've done really well. Uh, they had our first clutch of babies, we got like 55 eggs and 55 hatched. So you can see how small they are when they hatch. And so we were able to raise these and send these to other zoos. And I think a clutch of 33 just cash in the past couple of months, too. So a remarkable chameleon. Now they can be used in programs for exhibits or breeding programs. And then they're also tame enough that they can use, be used in our education programs. And then you might know that in the past spring, we just acquired cheetahs. Uh, very, cheetahs are very popular, but they are very rare. We're having some coming from Africa in the fall to get presentations to our community just about the status of cheetahs. But uh, cheetahs are an unusual animal in that there were so few at one time that they've gone through what we call the evolutionary bottleneck, where they were all really family related and they came out of the other end. So you can really do a skin graft on any cheetah in the world. And any wild cheetah in the skin graft will take because they're, they're all so closely related. Uh, but they're doing very well in our exhibit in Africa. Who would it be for? Uh, well, we have two males that are on loan from another zoo. Uh, it will decide in the future. Our option really is to, because you have to keep siblings who only live together, the big cats, if they're raised together, an option for us is to trade them out from the same, the same zoo. We get a female that's pregnant, and then we would have cubs. Um, or we could be a larger group of males. It really just depends on the group and when they decide these young male cheetahs need to go somewhere else. And that's to meet their, their needs. Our exhibit really doesn't allow us to breed large numbers of cheetahs. We're able to breed lions and tigers. We've got big behind the scenes and spaces. When you, you, when you sign an agreement to breed any of these animals in an accredited zoo, you have to also agree to maintain your offspring for up to three years. So we have a big behind the scenes that is for certain you know, we spoke but not she does right now. So we'll see. Uh, tell you a little bit about what we do from a conservation standpoint. The four components of our uh, our 
mission are to deliver a great um, recreational opportunity to our community to uh, provide uh, a great place for animals to live and also to provide conservation initiatives where we support scientists in the field or we support local conservation initiatives. So we've reestablished our wetlands at the end of our parking lot. You might have seen you've got a large, one of the largest oyster beds um, in the Norfolk area from a local standpoint. We do some other things on property for water um, retention initiatives to some of these international programs that we're involved in. Our veterinarian who lives in Columbia Place, by the way, uh, travels to a elephant sanctuary in Thailand each year and provides some of the medical care for those animals. So these are animals that are really used uh, as a labor force in Thailand where you can buy an elephant, she said, for about $1,000 and then it's primarily used to do some logging work or some sort of labor work in the mountains. Now, this area, as you can see, the mountains are in the background of this picture. But a lot of times these animals, they're not built to really live uh, 45 degree angles, so they might get like it and foot injuries, that sort of thing. So you can see this animal, its back leg has been broken and then it's healed correctly. And then it's sent to the sanctuary where there's about 300 elephants, where they invite uh, tourists to come in and see them and all of this. So our veterinary volunteers there go give them uh, the medical attention recommendations uh, that they need. So that's part of one of our conservation projects. Our, my assistant director is highly involved with various governments throughout the world from uh, St. Vincent in the Caribbean to, uh, he's an adjunct professor at the University of the Philippines, and he helps uh, establish kind of census work for animals that live in those areas and then also a lot of training and research for their local scientists. Our goal in a lot of these pieces is to train local people to do the best they can for their wildlife too. Uh, but these are some of the conservation projects that we're involved in internationally, uh, I mean, from elephants and rhinos to tigers uh, to those great big hornbills, those birds that you might see in that big aviary. In that case, we actually uh, provide money to the University of Bangkok where they train local people to protect the trees that these big birds might be nesting in. So um, there's a lot of really neat community involvement. Globally, for all these projects. In the left hand side here, the Turtle, Turtle Survival Center, that's a facility that was built in South Carolina to house turtles and tortoises that are being over hunted in Asia primarily. So you might know that um, a lot of turtles and tortoises, sharks, rays are uh, part of the menu in Vietnam and China primarily. So a lot of those confiscated animals, especially turtles, are brought to South Carolina to a big facility there that we help fund. Um, and they try to raise and breed a lot of these turtles so that someday they may return to parts of their range where their numbers are low. So a lot of interesting projects. We're involved with probably 10 that are our main focus, but we probably send around $100,000 each year uh, to their programs and hopefully that will double the next couple years. And then like I said, locally, uh, we're a regular river star with the Elizabeth River Project, project and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. One of our exhibits in our reptile building is going to feature uh, seahorses uh, for the Elizabeth River Project. Uh, this is some of the animal species we work with in the Lilo Islands in the Philippines. Uh, and we just went this past February and provided a training workshop about managing wildlife there to the local people there. And then new exhibits coming in the near future. Uh, we're closing down our reptile house. It's a picture. Closing down the reptile house next week. Uh, and we're going to gut that entire building. We're lucky that it has strong bones. So we just have to gut the interior. We're going to double the exhibit space there. Add on two new buildings to that. Uh, one will feature a giant crocodile species. We're going to put in a large tower at the entrance there, if you know. Remember how you walk towards that building, it's really nondescript. You can't really tell where the entrance or the exit is. Uh, now we're going to build a tower at that entrance so that when you're at the in the water plaza, as you mentioned, as you can see the, the entrance to the reptile house from there, when you leave the building, you'll know it will send it more than two. So uh, that's an exciting project. We're going to have a lot of floor to ceiling uh, exhibits there. 
guess have a whole additional um, profit out of the room. So it should be a really exciting project. Our plan is to open that towards the end of 2017. And another project I'm pretty excited about, I think everyone knows that the, our elephants now live in Miami. Uh, we put a herd of three group of white rhinos in that exhibit. And our goal eventually is to, to create a feeding and paddock opportunity with this group of white rhinos. And this is an example of one at Singapore. Yeah. 
every year. We also have breakfast with the animals, which is coming up soon. Uh, and that's when we uh, share breakfast with our members, and then we go and we feed all the animals breakfast. So you get into the zoo early, like 8 a.m., and then have breakfast with the animals. And then this is the zoo team. We have about 60 full-time staff, and then we might hire another 40 in the busier season in the spring and the summer. Thank you. 
environment. And we put those out for big events, um, like we have International Time Day this month on um, July 30th. So they'll put some special enrichment out for our tigers um, that day, and then we'll have volunteers out there with the tiger conservation card. We'll have buttons for conservation for donations. We'll also have crafts for kids. Um, this past month we had giraffe day, and our volunteers helped kids make little giraffe hats, and people were walking around with little giraffe ears and things, and it was really cute. So our volunteers help with a lot of different things, um, and I can talk all day about it, but I know you guys have stuff to, to talk about tonight. Um, but if you are interested in being an individual volunteer with us, we do have an orientation uh, this week, either this Thursday, July 14th, from 6 to 7 in the evening, or on Saturday, July 16th, from 6 to 7 in the evening as well. Um, the orientation will be at the zoo. We'll have signs telling you, you know, where to walk to for the orientation. Um, we do have applications on our website. I've given you uh, my card. You can email me if you want more information. You can call me. You can go on our website and fill out an application if you'd like. You don't need to do an application before the orientation, um, but you will need to do it at least down the road. Um, and then if you have any other questions about volunteering with us, um, I'm always happy to talk to you about it. Um, and then going back to youth volunteers, we do have um, our conservation youth team in the summer. So they've already started for this year. We do early applications, um, which will probably start somewhere around December. Um, those are for high school students, and it's a combination of a volunteer program and a youth development program. So we do a lot of team building, a lot of additional educational opportunities for them, as well as them volunteering with us. So that is something that we do offer. Um, or you can come as a family if you want to come in for a day. So that's the short version of our volunteer program. So if you guys have questions, or Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Could you say a good thing with Lions were our lions um, do have approval to breed. Now it's up to them. You know they've had two litters <laughs> yeah. in the past six, eight years. Yeah. So they are they are recommended to breed again now. Okay. I've I been over there a week or so ago and they were a uh, little active. So was... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, hopefully we'll have some more lions. Will we see elephants again? Uh, no, well the rules for elephants have changed. Uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, and it's also it's a difficult story to get across, of course, to everyone when the media really just wants to jump on the bad news topic of sending an animal off or an animal death. Uh, elephants, polar bears, killer whales are animals that have never bred well in captivity. When they came in, like uh, our elephants, Monica and Susie, you know, 46 years ago, they were really sold off in their onesies and twosies or threes to zoos or circuses or wherever they were way back when. Uh, so, and you probably know elephants hang out with matriarch herds in the wild and by a female and the breeding group of females and the males are solitary. So they, they lost a good chunk of that species identity because they were young when they came in, probably four to six years old. Uh, so we've learned all that about elephants now. You can imagine like this zoo's changed tremendously. It's 115 years old. There's a whole lot of flavor in the past, all those stories I've heard from the sororities on Granby Street that would come in and get beer and cigarettes in the night to everything else that happened at the zoo. You know, I teach a class on uh, zoo history and I think it's all kind of magical, all those different philosophies of how we care for animals over time. But uh, so you can imagine we've learned a ton about elephants. Now really learning more about them in the wild and then comparing that to what's happening in captivity. So they've never bred well, they've lost part of their species identity. Uh, they get foot problems from being held on hard surfaces for too long a time, which is really indoors in our case, you know, when it's too cold for them to go outside. But you can imagine there's a lot of zoos north of us that have elephants, but, or have elephants. So the recommendations are now is that they need more social engagement or social choice among other elephants to kind of regain some of that uh, identity lost. Uh, so they need to be kept in a uh, herd, more of a herd form like that. They need softer substrates, better climate, climate, all those sorts of things. 
the lucky thing for us is that because so that elephant population is a dwindling population in the zoo business or in captivity, there's still only 68 zoos in the country that have them now. Uh, and there's probably only five zoos that breed them. And half of those, there's really traumatic disease issues that kill elephants when they're about two years old. Uh, that it's really nearly impossible to control those types of diseases that they get. So um, now, because our elephants were healthy, they were healthy to travel and join other elephants. If we didn't send them now in the next three years, I'm sure that we would have lost one of our elephants due to complications with the old age. Uh, then we would become a zoo that had one elephant, and then we had to require one of these other aged elephants from another zoo. So we would be having an elephant funeral probably every three to five years from here on out. That's just how it would have gone. So we were, we had the opportunity to send them a great home in water climate. You know, they're outdoors on soft substrates to join two other African elephants right now. Uh, and I think as time goes, our facility is about an acre. Uh, I don't think that animal welfare folks would have allowed anyone to get away with an elephant exhibit that's less than four acres. Which if you ask me now, if we were going to get into the breeding business of elephants, which would be six to eight elephants. I would say you probably need 50 acres. So our whole zoo would really, you know, if you want to do it out there right, you, you know, we'd be a herd of elephants and you know nothing else. So I just think that's where it has to go. I don't agree that any elephants should be held in zoos more than us either because we can never build a large enough indoor area uh, for the winter for animals. But it's happening, you know, it's the National Zoo's Elephant Center is nice. Uh, a big collection just went into Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, but we are more in the world of, say, PETA, and we're not enemies, you know, we all help each other be smarter about the animals. Omaha, Nebraska isn't, so they're going to they can do whatever they want, sort of. so they just got a green group of six elephants. But in the winter, they're going to have to be indoors, so, you know, I think that's, that's a big challenge. I wouldn't want to be on the decision-making team saying, oh, this is going to be great for elephants, when you know it's not going to be open an acre anymore. So, you can imagine all those challenges that went along with elephants. And I think over time we'll see a kind of a public reaction if it's not right, just like what happened with killer whales. If you've seen that movie Blackfish, you know, about you know, the limited space that killer whales had. But I think the elephants, because they're land livers, you know, land ends, it's a different sort of picture than killer whales where the ocean feels like it goes on forever. You know, how can you put something from there? To to something smaller than the elephants a little bit more understandable, even though they might be able to eat a lot as much as they can. So we won't see elephants, but with a right, white rhino population too, it's more deliverable to our mission overall than their animals. Uh, we can house comfortably, we can breed, you know, so we can show the whole life cycle of them. With elephants, it would have been part of our story over time. Long story. And it was hugely traumatic to go through the whole Sending the elephants off, you can imagine, you know, with our staff. All the stages of grief. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. But the interesting thing about them is one cup was warm, we have cameras on them and all that. So 
sort of stuff. The mother wasn't showing it any attention. The SSP said you're going to probably have to send that cub to another zoo where they're rearing another tiger so they don't want to imprint, or imprint less on a person. So we're like, oh no, we're going to give up our only tiger cub. So we have a joint zoo where there's another cub of similar age and they'll raise them together. And then 24 hours later, she had another baby. So that's pretty amazing. I think if you know dogs and cats, if they're not all there within six hours, you know, pretty much So it's pretty uh, unique. Now, what zoo event might you see the area's largest whooping cushion? Zoo? Right. Oh, that's That's right, zoo. I would recommend you go there whether you dress up or not. It's fun to watch every day. We don't show movies at the Virginia Zoo. We show what? Crazy man. Zoo. Yeah. 
discussed it a lot earlier, but if anyone is interested in getting involved with community crime prevention, please email me at crimeprevention at cprv.net. Anything for community improvement? Okay. Um, as far as old business, we are working very diligently to get the mermaid placed back on the pedestal. Um, we are going to we are hoping to have this all done sometime in August. And when we do place her back, we are going to have a dedication ceremony um, and celebrate having her back where everyone can see her. Uh, the Civic League has agreed to adopt a spot, specifically the experimental walkway along Mayflower, along Minnie Mill Creek. And you'll be seeing things about that in the uh, newsletter as far as ways you can help and, and, and primarily it's, it's doing a lot of observation keeping track of what's going on along the walkway how the plants are doing what the different types of uh, material that they've used which ones they seem to be surviving better um, and eventually hopefully it will become the material that they'll use all along there. Uh, let's see New business. Uh, we have a new restaurant that will be coming in over here where Cafe M used to be, Carmine's. Uh, the, that is the, the people who own Ten Top over um, off of Collie Avenue. On Sherry Avenue. Right. Mm -hmm. They will be opening um, the restaurant here. I don't think we have an opening date yet. I think they just are. Um, they, I think they're just just getting their permit in. So Carmine's or Clementine's? Clementine's. You're right. The dog is just Clementine. That's their daughter's permit. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't know where I came from. They're going to start off with serving brunch on Saturdays and Sundays <coughs> and um, build from there to eventually be open. Uh, I think it's four nights a week, in addition to doing lunch, to serve um, dinner. And let's see, anybody else have any new business? Anything they want to discuss? Uh, yes, sir. I just had a question. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a resident of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I'm, I'm just wondering, has the city ever responded to why there are no fishing signs along the, uh, the public walkway on, on Mayflower, or has it ever been uh, Race that have concerns about that. It looked like they've gotten pretty uh, adamant about no fishing. I know the Coast Guard issued some citations not that long ago for, for no fishing to some uh, some people that had uh, uh, fishing licenses. I know that um, the issue's been raised. I don't know that we've gotten a response specifically from the city. Uh, my understanding was that there had been some complaints from the residents along Mayflower, and I don't know how long ago that was, um, about trash and things being left along the bulkhead and loud noises, and I think that was what prompted the most recent uh, installation of the no fishing signs. Um, but other than that, I don't think we've, had, we've gotten any Thank you.